I'm Steve Smith, the Great Bays Tennis Podcast with Brandon Flanagan at the FM Tennis Performance Center in Boynton Beach, Florida. Today we're going to interview Manny Diaz. He's a bulldog. He was a player, assistant coach, coach, been there forever. He's won this and that. We'll talk to him about his success at the University of Georgia. That'll be fun. But we also want to, most importantly, reinforce the Welby Van Horn balance method. And Manny's from Puerto Rico, and he was taught by Welby. So let's give Manny a call. Dialing for Manny. Got it? Here we go. Ring we number one. Hello. Manny. Steve, can you hear me? Yeah, Steve and Brandon. Can you hear him, Brandon? Hey, Manny, how you doing? We're good to go. Um, I'm here. Good to be with you guys. Let's go with the football. How'd you guys do yesterday? Oh, we, we're looking good. I think we won 47 to 17 or something like that. Go dogs! Number one in the country, right? <laughs> yeah, right now That's we're great. playing well. And, That's great. Yeah. Talking about yeah. systems of instruction with um, your head coach, he – came through uh, the Alabama program, correct? Head coach now, who's this now? The head football coach at Georgia. He, he... Oh, yeah, Kirby. Uh, yeah, he, he um, was with uh, Saban. I believe he was with Saban in, at LSU, then in Miami uh, wow. with the Dolphins, and, and then with uh, Alabama. Yeah, so it's great. You guys are undefeated? Yes. Oh, wow. All right, go, go Bulldogs. Um, why don't you tell us, our listeners, uh, how long you've been a bulldog? I know you're you're uh, you look much younger than me, but you've been a bulldog a long time. Those guys with good, <laughs> those guys with good hair, you know. Uh, well, I'm, this is my 40th year as a coach, so I came back oh, in '82. Wow. You know, I I played uh, here at Georgia from uh, fall of '71 through uh, spring of '75. And then, um, you know, I, um, I hurt my shoulder as a, as a senior at the tail end of my senior year. So I had to spend an extra year here rehabbing. I couldn't play for uh, about a year. But, you know, I wanted to play badly, and that's, that was my dream. And, you know, after that year, it took me about, I don't know, eight months to, to kind of get back uh, to playing tournaments. Um, that's how long a rehab process I had. Basically, they told me that, I needed surgery, but if I had surgery back then, uh, you know, they opened you up, they sliced you up. There was no arthroscopic. And, and if they opened your shoulder up, you were, you were done. You, oh. you had to retire. So uh, the other, other option they gave me was to take a year off and then begin sort of a re, you know, a, a playing rehab, you know, you begin to hit, but you know, it's a slow, slow recovery. So I, I, you know, I, I, I went out there and, and gave it my all and, and got to about 275, I think, or somewhere in there, and um, had some good wins, but I could never stay healthy enough. My shoulder was never the same. So, so I came back. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I, I came back in 82 as an assistant to, to Coach McGill. So you've seen, I'm sure, a huge progression in the, the sports medicine program at the school as well as you know, many other uh, no. factors, I'm sure, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Manny... 71 75 so when you were you were a freshman could you play on the team because at one point freshmen uh, couldn't play yes no we could play i think it, it the, that the freshmen uh began to be eligible i think uh, about two or three years before i came um so i think it was somewhere about 68 or 69 maybe uh if i may be wrong it was just a little bit uh, uh, before my time the um, so you're 69 years old, 68, 69. I know we're not supposed to ask. That I'm question. 68. Yeah, I'm <laughs> so 68. <laughs> so the, uh, the 1952 birth year, arguably, is the best group of American men players ever. Yeah, that's uh, Jimmy Connors, right? That's, you know, um, Connors and Tanner and Connors. Godfrey. Dibs might have been a year Solomon. older. Solomon, and then there's a, a tier below those guys too. Who are really good. Right. Well. Unfortunately, I'm at 53. <laughs> yeah. 
But when you were growing up in Puerto Rico, you were allowed to play all the USDA juniors, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we came every summer. We we started uh, in Davidson, North Carolina. Harry Fogelman ran the Southern Open. We came to Atlanta. Uh, we went to uh, Nashville. Um, I think at one point, um, Nashville had a big tournament. Uh, we went to the TVI in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We went then to Louisville for the National Clay Courts and Springfield, Ohio, I believe it was, uh, for the Westerns and then to Galamazoo. So we were over here for like eight weeks. Oh, wow. Every summer. <laughs> Got a chance to play Kalamazoo for all four years. A great experience and um yeah uh still have friends from that era any uh, any particular matches stick out from junior tennis gosh you know i was uh i was a late starter so basically i wasn't a great junior i was just a good athlete trying to improve in tennis it wasn't really until my uh last year of juniors that i became number two in puerto rico to freddie de jesus who's uh number one junior player in the U S. Um, and, um, uh, it wasn't until after my freshman year in college that I began beating Freddie and some of these other juniors that were, you know, phenoms and great, great junior players. Um, so I, I was, uh, you know, I, I was just cutting my teeth and the juniors taking a lot of beatings and, uh, and learning from them. How many years were you, uh, the assistant under Dan McGill? How many years since I was uh, the assistant uh, for six years. Uh, after my second year, I became the associate head coach. Is just a glorified, really. I, um, he, you know, he he was just uh, trying to keep me at Georgia, and it didn't take much. Uh, you know, having played at the University of Georgia, it was, you know, by far and away where I wanted to be. Um, but uh, I was a total of six years his assistant. Dan McGill, what, what a character, What so charismatic, what he did for tennis. I was fortunate to be at your place. Uh, I know I was sitting around talking to you. I came a day early to watch a match and talking to you, but then he took me through the, the Hall of Fame. Uh, yeah. he, you know, I've read his book. It's amazing. Uh, Brandon, he was with Furman, so he's been, uh, been on your college camps. I think every, every kid should go see a dual match. It's like Davis Cup if they go to your place. I remember playing the uh, Southern Intercollegiates in the fall and being on court next to oh, John. Oh, yeah. Yeah, next to John Isner. And the way he, <laughs> you would remember, the way he sat on the benches, he kind of had to sit on the bench in a different way because he was so tall. He, would, he always he, he always crossed his leg um, the same way at, at the bench. Yeah. He still does. If you really watch him on changeovers, he always will sit down and immediately cross his legs. Yeah, but it's an incredible facility, and we had a lot of fun there. It was <laughs> It was great at Furman to to play you guys really every every year in the spring. Also, every I year, yeah. I wasn't an everyday player and, and didn't get a chance to play a lot of matches in the spring. Um, you know, like a late starter myself, but it was it was great to uh, to have that opportunity. It's um it's it's great, yeah. It's it's great. We we you know we play uh you know nowadays with the with the limits uh, the NCAA imposes. You know, there there's less of those intra. Right. Um, conference matches, but um, you know we're still you know we're still trying to play a, a, a diverse schedule. Yeah, I know uh, our coach Paul Scarpa would sometimes play before they instituted these rules. They would play sometimes three dual yeah. matches in one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Paul Scarpa. Well, I mean, I'm sure you got a million stories. He's, yeah. he's uh, very creative and he ingenious, is. and a great great guy to boot. But what you know. Um, he was, uh, you know, and Coach McGill was a little absent-minded. Uh, you know, those guys were doing so much back then. They were wearing so many hats. Well, one day uh, after Coach McGill had retired and I'm the, I'm the head coach, we continued to play him. And we're, we're beginning practice, and all of a sudden, uh, Paul Scarpa and his uh, Furman team, show, they, they show up, and they come in through the gate, and they start going to the bottom courts as they always did to warm up. And I see them and I go like, what in the world is going on? <laughs> so I go over there and say hi to Paul. How you doing? And he said, we got a match today, right? And I go like, no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, 
well, do you mind if we practice? Wow. <laughs> and I said, absolutely not. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we didn't have a match that, that time on, the, on our schedule, but um, That's so funny. It, it, it's funny. Yeah. I've, if I had a vote, I would have the, I would vote to have the NCAAs at your place every year. I know that, you know, people argue that, you know, you have a home court advantage or the Northern teams have to maybe fight a little humidity, but it's just a great, great atmosphere. It's, it, it is. And, uh, it, it's, it's, yeah, it's phenomenal. And to be honest with you, I mean, most, most coaches, uh, come to me and, and, and say the same thing, but, uh, you know, all we can do is, uh, you know, say that uh, we're here whenever the NCA committee, you know, wants us to do it. Um, we're ready and willing and able. And uh, we continue to make improvements to our facility. You know, last year um, we inaugurated our new grandstand. Uh, it's got chair back seats all in the lower bowl of the grandstand. And we've got, you know, along with the Hall of Fame seating and the mid court seats and the seats by court one and, and our clubhouse we've got a lot of you know um uh you know premium seating um and and so you know it 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 continues to improve and uh we are breaking ground in our new six court indoor facility at the end of april when we get done with our regular season this coming spring so um you know we've uh fundraised 20 million dollars and um and uh you know it's 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 going to be a great one that's incredible can we just rewind a little bit to your playing career um, and maybe talk, talk a little bit about your playing style? How would you characterize sure. the way you played and and uh, go into that a little bit? Well, uh, I, I would say that um, I was, um, you know, m- mostly a serve and volley guy. I mean, okay. back then, uh, the courts were so fast, uh, you know, they weren't like today's courts. Um, you know, now even grass is somewhat slow. Right. Um, you know, back then it was, uh, it was a very fast cement, uh, asphalt, uh, court. And, uh, there, there wasn't, uh, you know, I grew up playing with wooden rackets. Um, I switched, uh, to an aluminum racket my senior year and went on, you know, to continue to play with composites and graphites. But, you know, as I, as I was growing up, it was, a, it was a wooden racket. So, <clears throat> um, I had a very strong serve and uh, athletic. I moved very well for a big guy. So, you know, my serve was, uh, was, uh, probably one of my best shots and, uh, um, you know, and my athleticism around the net was also a, a very strong suit. So I was, I was mostly a serve and volley guy. So now as you've, you know, obviously the game has sped up, the courts have slowed down a bit. Um, how have you been mm-hmm. able to incorporate some of your playing experience, you know, rushing the net with your players and the team? Have you found that to be something that you can, you, you can do with them? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I just, uh, I, I think as a coach, I, I just uh, have to, uh, or I don't have to, but uh, I think the biggest thing is to try to um, evaluate each player uh, on their own merits. And, right. and I don't, I think one of the biggest things a coach can do is, is say, this is my style. And this is what, uh, you know, um, I, this is the way I want everybody to play. Um, I right. think you, you gotta, you gotta evaluate everyone's, uh, you know, uh, strengths and weaknesses, try to, you know, try to fortify or strengthen their weaknesses and try to, uh, you know, try to get kids to be complete players. That's, that's what I'm interested in because, you know, you you got to play some guys one way if you want to win, and you got to play some guys, some other guys, completely different. So uh, that doesn't mean, uh, you know, that, that doesn't mean y- y- you completely change your game. I mean, you have a you have to have a good, uh, you know, a, a good uh, belief in in what you do well. But um, you know, it's uh, it, with a slower court, uh, you know, you got you got to be a little bit more well of a tactician maybe sure. um I, I believe that um you know court positioning is very important some of these kids as they come up as juniors you know they're they're you know they're just moving side to side and playing six or ten feet behind the baseline and you know if they want to be good complete players they they need to step up and sometimes play a little closer to the baseline they have to transition 
And it's always good occasionally to be able to mix in a servant volley here and there. And if not more than just occasionally, you, right. you know, you, you want to have complete players on your, on your squad and you make them, uh, you know, you make them drill on things that they are somewhat uncomfortable at times. If you want to, if you want to help them. I think you could expound upon that with uh, two Bulldogs, uh, Pern Fors and Isner. There's definitely Completely, two, two, yeah. two players with two different styles. Why don't you say a few things about those two guys? Well, um, yeah, they, they're, you know, the, the biggest thing with both of those guys, they're, they're the two, obviously the two best competitors, uh, I've ever been around. Uh, they're, they're, they're both kids that love to compete and the, um, the, the, the more difficult or challenging or nervous, the situation, you know, the hairier, the moment that's when they played their best. They just completely uh, embraced those moments, uh, both of those guys. Um, so, but, you know, one of them was five foot seven and a half, and the other one was, uh, you know, six foot 10, six foot 11. And, um, you know, one of them's strong suit was his serve, and the other one just put this serve in play and ran all over the place. Uh, um, for is... Uh... I was at Tyler Junior College for a, de- a decade, and Renato Figueiredo from Brazil, he lost mm-hmm. to Pern Forres in the Junior College Nationals. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but he won the NJCA twice, and he won the NCA twice, correct? Yeah. Won all four. He, um, yeah, he went uh, 40 and 0 at the NCA Championships. Wow. Um, yeah. And then he was in the finals of the French, right? Uh, two years, a year and a half, two years later, yes. 97, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 87, and I believe I, it was. When I first started, you know, learning how to play tennis and studying tennis, I watched a young uh, George Bezekny. Those two guys played yeah. the finals, right? Yes, and they were roommates. So we had, you know, two of our players, our number one and two players, meet each other in the in the finals. That was an easy match to coach. We just sat in the stands and, <laughs> and cheered for both of them. Uh, I remember um, watching George. But, I watched him in the 12s in Florida because I lived mm-hmm. in the Boca Raton area. He was from Fort Lauderdale. Yeah. And then I saw him in the NCAA finals. Then I when I, I went back to Boca and I was uh, <laughs> running an academy that he trained at, uh, Robbie Seguzo, Carling Bassett. And I'll never, uh-huh. for, never forget, but when I, I hadn't seen him play since he was 12. And then all of a sudden he's, he was a t- you know, televised match. The NCAA final, Pern Fors, Bezekny, and it's like, you know, you could just see, you just really stood out. Like, see, they still played so much the same that he played when he was 12, and he was just so solid from the baseline. Oh, he still loves to play. I mean, he comes to Athens to visit, uh, you know, I would say a dozen times a year. He loves Athens, and every time he comes, he's always uh, wanting to hit balls with uh, somebody. And he can still, I mean, he, you know, he was such a physical player. You know, George was, you know, um, he was a backboard back there. You know, um, he, he was uh, a strong baseliner. His forehand was phenomenal. Uh, and he just, uh, you know, he just wore people down uh, with his physicality. And he still gets out there and he, I mean, he can, he can hit with a 20 something year old and, and they don't, they don't, they, they don't miss anything. I used to hang out with Warren Woodcock at the Boca Hotel. He used the, I don't know how he did it. He was the head pro at Forest Hills and the head pro at, at the Boca Hotel. And it, he had two seven month contracts. So he worked 14 months a year, but he coached, oh, Peter, wow. he coached Peter Fleming. And I remember telling Peter, I said, you know, I'm taking, because I was hitting with Peter and I was just not good enough really. But I said, I got an idea because I took lessons from Ed Foster and, oh, yeah. and his son, Tommy, I said, why don't you just practice with Tommy and just hit to his forehand? Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and they said, just, just make him stand in one place and just hit to his forehand. And that's what they did. Yeah, Tom had one of the be- best forehands I've ever seen. A uh, very natural forehand. Yeah, like a Jimmy Arias. Just yeah. circle, clean top. Uh, let's go back uh, in time. Uh, <clears throat> Welby Van Horn. Tell us a little bit about Welby. I, as you know... You were taught to play by Welby. I was taught to teach by Welby, and we're trying to carry the torch for uh, the improvement of tennis teaching. And um, again, you there's a big difference between. I mean, you, you're basically starting kids at 18, and I spent so much time starting kids at eight. It's a kind of a different line of work. But 
I really think right. that the Welby Van Horn balance method should not be forgotten. What's oh, that? absolutely not. I mean, that's uh, that's something that I don't think will ever go out of style, especially, uh, you know, for beginners. Uh, I, I think it's the best way to start uh, young tennis players. I mean, uh, his system of, uh, you know, of uh, coaching, his system of learning, um, you know, from – from the start with, yeah, balance, um, grips, strokes, and strategy, that, that method, uh, I think still, um, creates an unbelievable base for, for anybody, yeah. you know, um, as the game progressed and, uh, uh, you know, uh, cause I was a junior and again, playing with wooden rackets at the beginning and it was a linear, you know, sport and everybody mostly hit the ball flat. I mean, you had labor maybe creating more spin than anybody. Uh, um, but, uh, you know, he, Welby was just such an intelligent person. I mean, and he could break down the game uh, in, in no time. He, he, he wasn't the most patient person with you, but he somehow with his lack of patience but and i mean that not in a in a in a bad way he, he would find ways to irk you to really challenge you to 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 <laughs> you know uh, i i was always trying to hit the ball too hard and he would just throw his racket down or if i didn't get a concept you know sometimes i left it the court completely frustrated um and sometimes uh, uh, you know almost in tears but he it somehow got me to come back so focused on overcoming what he had criticized. That was his gift. Um, other than his system, which he could, uh, you know, uh, teach so well. And, and all of his pupils, you can see them hitting five courts away and you go like, that's a Welby Van Horn, uh, pupil, hmm. uh, as you know, just, yeah. uh, you um, know, classic strokes, classic strokes, the balance, the, you know, the, uh, the anchor foot, the, the pivot foot, uh, you know, and that follow through was the same on just about everybody. And, you know, as a player, once you got pretty good, you know, I was one that kind of liked the challenge, uh, you know, things. And I would go, why can't I do that? I'm seeing Connors do that. Or I'm seeing labor because we used to have a big pro tournament, right? Labor came, uh, Rosewall, Hode, uh, all of the top players, Ash, Stan Smith, used to leave me his old tennis shoes after the tournament, by the way. <laughs> uh, um, and, um, you know, we used to ball boy for all those guys. And so, you know, when the tournament was over, I, I would I would start imitating a certain player. I don't, I don't know, Nastasi or Smith or on his serve. And, and I said, well, you know, and he would go like, what are you doing? And I would and go, well, you know, labor serves like this or labor, you know, follows through like this on his forehand. And his standard answer would be, well, labor has hit 1 million more forehands than you. Wow. He, he can, he can break those rules. He can pull away from those rules, but you can't, you're not ready. And he was right. He was right. So, um, while the game, and, I, and I'm saying that because while the game has evolved, um, you know, a lot of his teachings still hold true. Has uh, you know the, but you know, you could say what well, the mother modern forehand has evolved, and it, you know, it, the follow through is a lot lower. And he was one that actually took time to to see that right, um, and not because he couldn't see it, but because he still believed that kids at the early stages are better off learning the proper way, right? The classic way. Yeah, one thing with Welby, with a system for teaching beginners, I agree. I don't think there's any better way to approach it than how he started with, you know, no racket in your hand and just standing at the right. service line with him and he would just show you how, how your body would be in the ready position, unit turn, the step, the follow yeah. through. But I spent a lot of time with Welby and even to the point when his nineties at the uh, nursing home, but he I want to ask what happened with you in particular on the forehand side, because Welby had what he called the beginner's grip and then the championship grip. And at, right. at his time, 
three out of the four Grand Slams were on grass, and by the second week, the players were wearing spikes. And like say someone like Freddie De Jesus, a lot of Welby's players were so good in the early age groups. Did you make that change from a beginner grip, which was an Eastern, to more of a continental or composite on your forehand? I actually, uh, on my forehand, no. I went from uh, you know the Eastern to I didn't go semi Western, but I if I went anywhere, I went a little bit the other way. Yeah. Because um, uh, I saw the game going that way, and um, you know I was trying to generate a little bit more spin. Uh, so I went not, I wouldn't call it a semi-Western, but I went towards it. Let's put it that way. But Welby, um, actually we have to get Ed Weiss on as well. He wrote the book, uh, yeah. you know, and I've spent quite a bit of time with Ed. Um, but with Welby, um, in the nursing home, uh, he's in his nineties and we're watching Federer play and, and he, he was critical of all of this, but anybody he dealt with, he was critical of, but he was critical of himself and he, <laughs> And he knew that uh, he uh, had made a mistake on that particular part of teaching on the forehand grip. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, I remember when we were young and, uh, you know, Christy Everett came out, Jimmy Connors came out with a two-handed backhand. I mean, uh, and he he fought, you know, he he, he, he fought the two-handed bank, backhand forever, but then he, you know, he, he, he saw – he saw the benefits of it. So, um, you know, uh, same, I, same I think thing he, with, same thing with the swing volley. He was, that's right. Yeah. Go ahead. No. Um, you know, and, um, you know, I, I remember, you know, him evolving it just like everything else. Right. Uh, you know, um, you have a system and, and you have all the success and, you know, he was producing more U S junior national champion, tennis players than anybody in the United States in a little four court complex in mm -hmm. San Juan, Puerto Rico. Um, you know, so he had reasons to, to continue to believe in his system. And, he, you know, I would say that Welby was a purist, right? And, 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 and so, um, maybe slow to evolve in, in, in some ways, but I still believe that his system holds, holds true, uh, has, you know, something's changed. Yeah. Can you um, improvise a little bit more on certain facets uh, of the game? Absolutely. And I think he did uh, in, in his, you know, latter stages. Now, Manny, obviously you're, you're kind of carrying the torch for these players who come to you as freshmen from their coaches who coach them in the juniors thinking mm -hmm. about how I never had the privilege to meet Welby, but obviously I've learned uh, all of his concepts and techniques through Steve uh -huh. um, would you find that you've, you've mentioned, you know, how critical, how disciplined he was. Would you find that that compares to today's junior coaches? Is he, was he more strict? Do you think than most of today's coaches or less strict? How would you, <laughs> I'm going to leave that, that answer up to you, but how would you characterize his discipline? Yeah. Um, I don't, <laughs> you know, let me think, I, you know, if there's one criticism, and and I don't mean the the very best uh, junior coaches nowadays, I just think too many coaches. Let's put it this way: too many co too many junior coaches are way too tolerant of mm. of of uh, kids and too um um uh, I, I would say too easy on on the kids mm. uh, in in a, in a way because. They're afraid of losing, you know, lessons. They're afraid of losing uh, kids from uh, to another tennis program. I, I and, and I I do believe that nowadays, you know, kids, um, it, you know, they go home and <laughs> to be honest with you, that they may complain just like they complain if they're baseball. You know, I'm not getting to play enough. I'm not getting enough. Uh, you know, at bats or. You know, they come home and, you know, and if a kid says their coach was, was tough on them, you know, I think the parents are a lot more liable in today's world to find somebody that's a little nicer to Billy. Um, right. Instead of, instead of uh, you know, going like, well, there's, there's a reason, uh, you know, we're, you know, discipline and, 
uh, and practice and coaching is, is not about, you know, somebody just being, uh, nice to you all the time. <laughs> right. It's about teaching you certain concepts and getting you to, uh, to, you know, to, to work on things and, 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 you know, without, without struggles, you can never be a great player, right? In anything, uh, sure. or in, 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 in any endeavor. And so I think that, um, I also think that things are, uh, a little bit, um, you know, have changed when, when it comes to parenting. So, um, kids are more liable to be jumping from one program to another or to five or 10 in their junior days. Yeah. Um, I mean, part, part of my ignorance, but was Welby the kind of the only gig in town as far as tennis instruction, uh, or was there maybe less options, uh, where you were? <laughs> well, uh, I wouldn't say he was the only one. I mean, we had, we had several very good coaches, but I knew he was the best. Right. Uh, a lot of, you know, most people knew he was the best. Uh, so while sometimes I left very frustrated and almost in tears, um, I knew what he was trying to accomplish. Right. Um, and I knew that he was demanding because he was trying to get me to be my best. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I always came back. For the for the longest time, uh, Nick Baltieri was in San Juan, but he was uh, just dealing with re- right. resort players. Alex Mayer. Yeah, no. Uh, yep. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I took a lesson with Nick before he was famous. Nick, uh, you know, you also had Juan Rios, who was a protege of Nick, an assistant to Nick. Uh, he was from Puerto Rico. He's still in his eighties and still teaching down there. Um, and Luis Ayala, who's uh, who was top ten in the world. Uh, from Chile uh, was based at the Rocket Club in San Juan as well. So he he was a very good coach as well. Um, but you know, I stuck with Welby because I knew his methods. Um, you know, paid dividends. He had a great reputation, and and he was the best. Was there thinking back on it? Was there one particular character trait that you had as a young as a young man that kept you coming back, even though he was such a strict tennis coach? Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, um, I, I was getting my brains beat out every day in practice. I mean, I was, I was, I was a very, very good baseball player, uh, who somehow fell in love with this sport. And, uh, you know, my first, you know, my first match, I lost to Juan Brashi, who's number two in the U S he was younger than me. And then I lost to him. 6060 oh, oh, and I went like it 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 ticked me off <laughs> and I, I think that was my my driving force right uh, I I was determined that I was going to eventually beat all those guys that were beating my brains out mm. <laughs> and and some kids maybe uh, would have gotten discouraged um, but for me it was the opposite a couple of things on uh, Welby's greatness uh Dr. Alex Mayer, both his sons, uh, Gene and Sandy, were top 10 in the world. And Alex Mayer was asked where he rated himself. I'm sure this is on the podcast where we talked about Welby. He said, well, I think I'm one of the top five tennis teachers in the world. And then he said, what about Welby Van Horn? He said, nobody compares to Welby. He goes, I don't even put him in the same group with us. He was that respected by the insiders. Which was really sad because he... you know, we'll get into that a little bit, but Welby was, he never spoke at the USTA or USPTA conventions at that nope. time. The, the PTR was started in 77, the USPTA in 27. Mm-hmm. Here's a story though. Dr. Julie Anthony was a player and then became a psychologist. It's in, in her book about Charlie Passerell and Joe Brandy and Joe Brandy who had polio and one leg was a little longer than the other and, or a little shorter, I should say. And he was, I think ranked 33 in the nation. Yep. And, and Charlie wanted to qu- quit tennis and his mother said, if, it, if your cousin can play on one leg, you're not, <laughs> you're, you're not going to quit tennis. But I think that Welby, um, here's a question just to go back to his toughness. Put you on the spot here. Michael Pernforth, John Isner, and Welby Van Horn. Who's the most competitive of those three? Wow. Um, <laughs> I, listen, 
I've never seen anybody as competitive as Welby. No, that's Welby would be playing a board game, uh, and you know they used to you know have this football uh, game that you played with dice. I never really got got to play Welby, but whether it was that, whether it was chess, he was the most competitive person I ever saw. I saw him bet a tourist. I think at the time, I'm not sure if it was a hundred or a thousand dollars, and he tied a chair to his leg <laughs> and played the guy for like a hundred or a thousand dollars. I'm not sure what it was, but wow. he played him. He he tied a he tied a chair to his leg and played him. <laughs> yeah, follow up <laughs> for on that. money. I, mean, I was going to ask. I mean, did he play you left handed? I'm used to play kids. Yes, really young kids. Yes. In 1939, it was in the U.S. Open final, and 40 years later, yeah. 40 years later, McEnroe using the same racket that Dunlop Max played. Yeah. Welby used yeah. to play kids, the really young kids, with no strings and just hit the ball in the throat. Uh, yeah, play- he'd love a he, he loved the bet, and uh, you know, it, 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 I don't know if, if I was 15 or 16 or whatever. Every now and then, you know, um, the courts were sort of empty. It was hot as heck, and he didn't have a lesson and he, he, he take, you know, he'd take us on like he'd play us a set. And it, well, I don't think it was until I was 17 years old, I could beat him. He was just a smart, he, he you know, he'd only last a set, but he, he'd beat all of us in a set match. Mm-hmm. Nandan Ball a good player. And I'm not sure if he was ranked 200, 300, but he's a really good player. And it was probably in front of 250 people, but at the Choate School in Connecticut, Welby played him one set. And of course, Welby, he just knew how to intimidate people too, is that, you know, during the warm-up, Nandan hit the first, yeah. first ball in the net, and there's 250 people. No one left, because that's how captivating Welby was. <laughs> I mean, he stopped and gave the guy a 15-minute lecture. And I was like, <laughs> you're going to miss a warm-up? You're going to miss the first ball in the net? But just yeah. so, so, so competitive. Yeah. Um, Dan Gold, he had a chance to talk to him just this week. And um, he he won the NCAAs in 86, and then he played three years. He got to be 27 in the world, got the quarters of Wimbledon, beat Connors. So he went back to see his old coach, Jack Shore, who's in his uh, late 70s, still teaching. And, and Dan said to him, uh, you know, because he just taught him balance and said, hey, People are trying to swing too too fast and do too much, and you got to have balance and be relaxed. And so he asked Jack Shore. He said, "Where did you learn this?" And he said, "Well, I was on a vacation, and I started watching this old guy teach tennis, and I just said, the heck with my vacation. I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm just going to watch this guy teach tennis the rest of the week.'" And um, if you remember Dan Goldie, obviously he hit the ball really well. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, he was, uh, I saw him play here at the NCAA. Um, yeah, and he was a great player. Um, yeah, he um, you know, will be had a way. But, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know what else to say. Uh, he was a special special guy. I think that to paint the picture four courts, um, my understanding, obviously I wasn't there, but you had to hit the backboard for 30 minutes before your lesson, and then after your lesson, I don't think you could do yeah. this today. You'd shadow swing in front of his pro shop window, and if you weren't doing what he wanted, like just over and over again for 30 minutes, shadow swing a low backhand volley, he'd bang balls. Uh-huh. At, he'd bang balls at you. Oh, he wouldn't. He wouldn't start. He wouldn't teach you a lesson unless you were on that backboard. Hmm. Like you had to earn it. And um, yeah, uh, if you weren't getting his concept, you didn't. You you didn't hit a ball. I mean, he'd actually have you in front of those big windows. Uh, doing it correctly, right? And um, um, yeah, he was thorough. Go ahead. I was going to say Frank DeFord wrote that article in Sports Illustrated. His, his system was so simple, is the older kids could teach the younger kids. Correct. I agree. I agree. And once you knew that system, I mean, everybody, <laughs> everybody that uh, came up with me. I mean, I guarantee you, they could, they could, they could teach it. They could, uh, they could, you know in front of a window they could do what we did 40 50 years ago uh to the 
to the to a T. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's pretty remarkable. How he got into the tennis camp business is uh, Phil. Phil and Betsy Eisenberg were there, Eisenberg. staying there on vacation, and something came up where Welby said, "Okay, I got to be twenty minutes for this lesson." But uh, this, you know, he had some young twelve-year-old said, "This guy, this this guy will help you out." It's, 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 Phil Philip Eisenberg tells the story. He's looking around for what guy, and he goes, "No, this guy. This is twelve-year-old kid." And, <laughs> and, then, and then from that, you know. Philip had a business mind and said, "Okay, well, we need to have you run a tennis camp," and that's how, that's how he got in the tennis camp business. That's, be, be, that's before before that, was, it was pretty just private lessons, correct? That's correct. He never he never taught clinics, never taught two people at once. Ah, maybe tourists you know, and his wife uh, or whatever, but he never he, he never did ran clinics to make more money. Uh, he, uh, he didn't care anything about that. Not that he didn't care about money. Uh, he, he just, he didn't try to package, uh, you know, and, and, and profit four times as much because, or he didn't care about you know, the numbers, uh, as much. I was trained to tease tennis by Dennis Vandermeer and I asked Dennis, who he, else he would recommend to study under, and he mentioned Welby, and he said he's the best junior coach in the world, but he's the worst resort coach in the world because you know you may take you may take three lessons where you don't hit one ball, but Dennis's right. uh, first wife Linda, she was taught to play by 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 Welby. Oh really? Yeah. With um, how many lessons a week did you have? One, one or two. Max, one, and you were expected to come back. And he gave you, you know, he gave you. This is what you need to work on. Uh, and but but you know, but we were there every day, and he would be, uh, you know, he would be teaching on court two, next to the, uh, you know, backboard. Um, and but I mean, again, four courts. He knew he he could see our, you know, and he would make comments on on you practicing on the next court or in the other two courts right behind him he could he knew everybody that was there i mean uh, a lot of us you know kids uh you know and adults came about five o'clock six o'clock but um you know he he would he would be supervising or making comments or you know having talks about strategy with you on every other day you know like um every every other day of the week so he you know, it, it was for us. I mean, we got out of school and we took the bus and we were there and, and we were there all day. So uh, it was like we were in his place. We were in his house the whole time. And he, he, he would line the younger kids up to play hotel guests and then and, and yes. wager money, right? Well, he, we didn't know it at the time, but yes, he would. <laughs> Maybe when you were a little older, that, then you were uh, yeah aware of it. <laughs> With uh, your, yeah. your college teammates, um, um, Gordon Smith, he, yeah. he ran the USTA for a long time. He was there when you were there at Georgia. He played doubles. Is that right? Oh, yeah. We, we were uh, roommates for all four years. Uh, Gordon and I lived in a, I don't know, it was almost like an eight by 10 cell. Um, um, and uh, we had four rooms in a dorm that kind of joined together, a big bathroom. That was a tennis team kind of suite. And, so we were all living together, but Gordon and I, you know, roomed together. Um, I was there when Gordon, yeah, Gordon met his uh, lovely wife Jane uh, the first day. Uh, I know and, he, uh, was, he led the USTA. He was what the president, correct, for years and years. For the yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, CEO. Yeah. With uh, why do you think that Welby was never really? Um, asked by the USTA, of course, this is long before Gordon Smith's day. I mean, I think Gordon Smith, uh, to me, I think he could call up uh, the new guys, take his job, uh, Michael Dowse, I think. With uh, Why do you think Welby was never really embraced by um, the governing body of tennis, the USTA, with when those players did so well? You'd think that they would have uh, said, hey, what is he doing down there? I uh, I don't know, and I was probably too young to really know uh, the dynamics there. Uh, but I I you know uh, having known Welby for so long, I mean Welby was his own person, and he 
he wouldn't, uh, you know, he, he wanted, he just wanted to do his own thing. And I don't think he was willing to, uh, dilute, uh, or change, uh, a whole lot from what he was doing. Uh, I think he was comfortable and he believed in his system and he believed in what he was doing. And he, he wasn't a very agreeable guy to 90% of the way other people play, to be honest with you. He, he was, uh, you know, he believed in what he believed and, um, he, um, there weren't a whole lot of other, uh, coaches, um, at the time that were doing what he was doing. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, he was, uh, he was in Puerto Rico because of his asthma uh, right, at right. the time. Uh, and uh, he, it's not like he, he could, uh, you know, move a whole lot of places. He, he eventually moved to Palm Springs again because that was also uh, a good place for his, uh, you know, bronchial issues. But, um, you know, he was, uh, yeah, he was, he was there because of, uh, you know, his, his, his condition and, um, at the time, uh, you know, he just decided to build it there and he was, he was happy with it, with everything, you know, he had at his disposal. I think the hotel, uh, the general manager of the hotel or the owner, I'm not sure, uh, of that Hilton hotel just, uh, just gave him, I mean, he used to live in a, uh, in a place inside the hotel property. So, he, at the time, he had a, a, a great situation there. He started a pro tournament in Puerto Rico where the very best players in the world, uh, I mean, all of them came came to play there. Uh, and he built that tournament. Uh, uh, you know, it was, it was, you know, he had his, he had his little jewel there. And um, he was happy there. I think he worked, I think it was 38 years, but, but he did work with under many d GMs and, uh, he was a permanent fixture. I mean, it's so he, uh, yeah. he obviously got along or it's like, well, you know, you just, you know, well, but yeah, he's just that he's a permanent fixture and you can't send him down the road. Uh, but being yeah. critical, I remember, uh, having breakfast with, um, and a gentleman who was a writer from the New York Times. It was in Piners, North Carolina. So I was very fortunate. I worked at Choate and then because actually I'm two years younger than Andy Brandy and we were 22, 24 and we didn't know anything obviously. And he was, hmm. he was telling me that Welby's the best. And I at that time thought Braden was the best. And so I said, well, I'm going to go work for Welby. And then I was very fortunate. I just thought my pl the plan was just to be with him that uh, summer at Choate. But then he went to Piners, North Carolina with his camp and my parents had, had retired near there and right next to the place. And then he went to Boca and at that time I was running a tennis academy in Boca. So I, I spent a lot of time around Welby. But anyway, this uh, uh, writer from the New York Times, he was there because Borg history making run at Wimbledon. And I can't remember when Victor Mai had him on the ropes, but Victor, he took some lessons as you know, from Welby. And then he went to yep. Holland, Michigan. So anyway, this writer, yeah. writer comes in and uh, says, do you think Victor could beat him this year? Because he's had such a big serve. Mm -hmm. That's before they changed the grass. And Welby said, well, and he just he just tore his game apart. <laughs> yeah, he just, yeah. Uh, because Welby would look at anybody's game, um, you know, like say Borg on the backhand volley or like a TFO today on the backhand volley. He would just yeah. go. And I, I remember asking you one time, uh, how much more money would Isra have made if Welby had taught him to hit the backhand volley? When he, <laughs> that's right. When he's a little, when he was a little kid, I mean, you. Um, I guess that's a question I could ask you. Um, what do you think John Isner's game would be like? I mean, you would start him at eighteen. Uh, what his game would have been like if he was taught by Welby? Well, um, hard to say. I think uh, John's. Uh, John's forehand is, is is a very natural stroke. Certainly, his yeah. backhand has improved a lot um, um, from his junior days, and uh, and even as a pro, has improved a lot. Um, but yeah, his backhand uh, volley grip, <laughs> we, I tried, um, but um, yeah, 
it's uh it, you know it, it, it there's uh there's only so much you can do after uh you know after you know you've you know you've been playing for a long time and you get to 18 you can modify you can make minor changes but you can't retool completely yeah. i remember i remember you know we had a great player over here uh Wade McGuire that hit his forehand in just a very peculiar way i mean he had he didn't hit a classic stroke i mean his you know his elbow flew up and he, he you know but it but it was an incredible shot and i remember uh he got to about 200 he was winning challengers and and so the USDA really showed him a lot more interest they wanted to help him along and they changed his grip because he had a very extreme western grip uh and yes he was a little bit limited on some low balls but I mean, I, I, I'm not sure exactly which of the USDA coaches changed his grip to an Eastern grip, and he was never the same. Mm. Not even after he tried to switch back to his old grip was he ever the same. And so, you know, you got to be careful, uh, you know, with with grips, and you got to, you know, you got to be careful when you make major changes to players because, um, you know, some of those things just they're they're unique to to them right no for sure i would think that affects a player's confidence number one i mean i think that's really, all of it really all hard. of it oh yeah. yeah that oh yeah i mean so you know wade was hitting the fence on his forehand mm -hmm. he just couldn't couldn't bring the ball down and you know mentally he was just uh you know not able to bring it back hmm. no my son connor uh spent a lot of time practicing with uh john isner he he's continued to get better. I'm some, how old is he? Yeah. 37, 38 now. I believe he's about thirty seven. Yeah, and still playing. Um, yeah, I mean, no, no. I just think that it, in Welby's era, that he would have had a one handed backhand. He oh would, yeah, <laughs> he, he would have taken second serves and come in off that one handed backhand. He would have just been all, <coughs> all over the net. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, when he got to Georgia, he never came in. Mm. Like he was, he was mostly, he was a baseline player. Uh, but the thing about John and all the great players, Michael Pernfors and some, you know, all the great players, they don't, they, they, they're honestly, they're more coachable than anybody else. They, uh, they don't tie their results to their, uh, to, to their self worth, they, they it, they're not they're not like that. Uh, so uh, when I asked John, you know, you're a big guy, you need to hit big, and you need to come forward, you need to transition, and I want you. I remember I want you serving volleying all fall, first and second serves. He didn't even go like uh, what? Like he didn't go, but that's going to be disastrous. He he just did it, and he understood the big plan or the, the, the you know the long term uh, you know uh, goal, and so uh, whether it was him or Matthias Boker or or or, or Michael Pernfors that they they have a, a bigger vision and they understand and they don't they don't get caught up in oh what if this goes wrong type of thing. Um, you know, as as much as uh, I, I, you know, John hates to lose more than he enjoys winning. I, I, you know, he he just he hates to lose, but he never felt like he was less worthy or less of a person uh, because he lost a tennis match. That you know, it just that the two were completely separate. That's great, and, uh, and and that's a great quality. That's the quality of a champion. Doesn't he have two older brothers too? Oh yeah, that must have helped a little bit. <laughs> oh yeah, it's always good to have yeah. those brothers beating you up a little bit. They have great stories about. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it just always about, comes down to character, doesn't it? I think uh, it's kind of what we were talking about earlier with with your background with Welby and the really disciplined coaching. You absolutely you, and. Yeah, and that's why, honestly, when I recruit, that's that's number one. That's what I look for. How, how does a kid handle adversity? How does a kid uh, act when he's been, you know, 
cheated or, or, or a call goes, you know, the, the umpire just got it wrong or, you know, uh, you know, character, um, reveals itself. And, um, and that's, uh, you know, that's so important because especially in, in college tennis, you're, 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 you know, you're one of 10 or whatever it is, 10 or 12 or eight or 15, whatever it is it. And, you know, you want kids that are able to push each other, um, to hold each other accountable and to, uh, you know, they, they got to play in the sandbox, you know, uh, with others. So, um, it's very important, uh, to recruit character, mm. not only in tennis, but in everything else. All right. Any one thing you could confirm, I don't know if this is true or not, but I, under the impression that Pern Fours was dropped, uh, the Swedes, the Swedes were helping him out. Like they, all the federations will help out some kids and, and, but his parents initially had to pay for him to come over to junior college. Is that true? Oh, I don't know if he, if they paid for him to go to junior college. I think he had a scholarship at junior college, but that's why he went to junior college is he, he wasn't that good as a junior. Okay. Uh, he wasn't in the elite, uh, group, uh, in Sweden then. So he had to earn it. He had to prove himself. Um, and you know, he's another one that, you know, just pressure never phased him. It seemed like I know that he was up two sets to no on Connors on that <laughs> Wimbledon, uh, match, but I mean, he just, he just, um, he was at his best, uh, under pressure, but, uh, he had to earn everything. He had to work hard and, and, you know, he was, uh, you know, he was past, uh, Actually, uh the, that match, he, I believe he was up two sets to love four one, but some guy in the stands yeah. said to Connors, give it up, old man. And then he just right. woke up the giant and Connors, if people, he just kept pointing to one guy in the stands and, uh, he, <laughs> found, he, he found a way to come back, but that, <laughs> that, right. that was epic Connors though. Yeah. Just to veer yeah. off into tactics a little bit, one thing that Coach Scarpa used to say, because uh, obviously he had experience during the, during the time that Perns Force was playing playing for you, um, mm-hmm. was the the delayed approach shot that he would use, and he would make us practice that. He would just call it the Perns Force, and I think uh, <laughs> just throw up a high, you know, a high topspin, you know, deep ball, and then kind of wait, yeah. wait, and then ghost in and play an approach volley, and he would have us practice that. And that's one thing Coach Scarpa would do is look for different things we about that? practice, but yeah. I think it's a tactic that some guys could still use today. I don't see it that often though. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, and, and, and Pern Forrest was very aware of what his strengths and weaknesses were. Right. Uh, he had a, he had a heavyweight forehand, but his backhand, he couldn't generate that much spin. So he had to keep it up or had to keep it down. He had a great slice as well. Uh, but one of his best shots was his backhand top spin lob. I mean, he would fake that passing shot or, you know, he would be dipping some passing shots, but one of his better shots because he didn't have that much of a powerful backhand drive, right? Uh, was that top spin lob and he used it on both sides, but, um, uh, just, uh, he was smart. He was a very smart player with yourself. It was so, such a lengthy career at Georgia for you and your players, your assistant coaches, what's it been like to be around the other coaches with the other sports? Oh, it's always great. I mean, we learn from each other. We, we meet a lot. We talk a lot. We, you know, we just, uh, have had just phenomenal folks around us all, all throughout. And, um, that's always, I mean, I always look to learn. I mean, when I was a young assistant and, and heck, as a head coach, even I mean, I would when we had the NCAA here, I would go see Glenn Bassett run his practice with his team. I would, you know, uh, you know, I would want to watch Dick Leach and uh, Dick Gould, and I saw, you know, I just saw the great coaches, and uh, you know, I knew they were great for a reason. So, um, and it was my job. I mean, I have always, you know, I've always said the day I, I stop learning from others is the day I need to retire. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's important to always be learning. It's often said that the SEC is the toughest conference right now. Why, why do you think that is? Yeah, I don't, 
know that there is a reason other than, you know, competition breeds, uh, you know, breeds excellence. And I, th- I, th- I think, uh, you know, for many years, obviously, we've had a very good team and a very good program. Um, and I think that other other programs and 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 you know they they want to compete they want to be competitive and they 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 have improved their facilities they have hired great coaches and and we've got we've got a great group of coaches very high standards and uh, in great facilities and you know nobody plays for second place uh, everybody wants wants to be the best so it's it's very competitive and i think we make each other better let me ask one more question. Maybe Brandon has another one as well. But with wrapping it up, we have a lot of parents that listen to our podcast and that they'll drive to tournaments or practice and, and listen, have their children listen. It's mm-hmm. so difficult to become a college tennis player. The the number, a you know, little less than 3%. What, what advice would you have for a kid? He's 8, 10, 12 years old to try to make it to a, you know, just to play college tennis. I mean, I think, I think even Division three is – you know, it's pretty high level, but to make it to be a college tennis player, what would your advice be? Uh, I mean, I, there's nothing that's going to be, you know, hard work. Um, it, 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 it really boils down to how badly you want it. I mean, if you love the sport, if you enjoy the sport, you don't mind working hard, set some goals, make sure you're getting good coaching and good direction. Um, and, um, you know, t- take your lickings. I mean, uh, you know, if, if, if you're, you know, if you're wanting it to be easy, you're in, you're in the wrong sport. Um, um, uh, you know, tennis being an individual sport is, is, you know, I, you know, I get it where football and basketball in some ways is more attractive because you're with your peers, you're with your friends, you suffer together. I mean, in tennis, you it's a little bit more you suffer kind of by yourself. So it takes a special, uh, special person, but tennis is such a rewarding sport. It's a life, you know, it's a sport of a lifetime. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't agree with, you know, I mean, the statistics are the statistics, but I think if you really love the sport, if you, you know, enjoy the, the game and you make up your mind to be good, I, you know, I think you, you have a good shot at it. No, that's a great answer. Why don't you wrap it up, Brandon? One more question. Thanks, Manny. Sure. Yeah. You mentioned uh, lifelong learning a minute ago. I think it's gotta be one of the number one qualities of, of a great coach. Um, any, Mm -hmm. any, any particular books or book uh, that comes to mind when you think of, you know, if you were to recommend a a book for young coaches or, you know, um, you know, potential, uh, a, a person, a coach who wants to get into the college game is anything that you really kind of enjoyed reading and rereading over the years you could recommend? Well, I, I, I have a, a big library of, uh, of, of positive thinking books, magic of thinking books. Uh, the magic of thinking big, I part, pardon me, uh, is a, is a book. I just gave one of my players, um, uh, the magic of thinking big, uh, made a big difference in my life. Master key to riches. I mean, uh, there's, um, uh, Maxwell Maltz wrote a book. Um, I forget the title now. But um, cybernetic. That was the book. That that was the first book I read. I think we talked about this, Steve. Um, yeah. At one point, uh, psycho cybernetics. Read uh, that book uh, as a senior in high school. I think that was <clears throat> one of the most influ- influential books I read um, early on, and it really made a big difference. Um, so, um, but, um, yeah, I'm always looking for, for a good one. So, uh, if you got a good one, <laughs> pass it on. No, cool, it's cool. been great to talk th- to you. you those guys... are some of, those are some of my favorites anyway. That's great. Yeah. Oh, thank you. You guys have a, a, a great, uh, mascot, the bulldog. You can't go wrong with the bulldog. That's right. But we, Andy, uh, go ahead. No, I mean the bulldog. <laughs> has his nose tilted backwards so he can breathe without letting go. <laughs> that was that was a thing. That was I love good. it. Actually, at one time I think there was uh, fourteen schools in the U.S. that were bulldogs, and there's one of the U.C. schools out in California 
that they were the bulldogs and they went to vote, and now they're the uh, banana slugs. So I think that <laughs> they're uh, the what? The ben- they're the yellow banana slugs. Oh my goodness! So uh, <laughs> no, I, I've been to Athens many times. Love going up there, but I have seen. Uh, you just go down the sidewalk and you see see quite a few people up there. They have pets that are bulldogs. It's great. Yeah, 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 yeah. They're all over. Uh, well, it's good being with you guys. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Manny. Appreciate it. I know our listeners will love it. So appreciate it. My this. pleasure. Thank all you right. so much. All the best to you, your family, your school, your team. Adios. Take care, guys. Thanks Thank again. You. Take care, Steve. Brandon. Yep. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye. <laughs> all right. Podcast number 66. That was fantastic. That really was. Any closing comments there, Brandon? Just so much, so much experience. Obviously, as a player, as a coach, um, it's really impressive. He's been at the same school really all that time. Um, that that's impressive on its own. But the the national championships, SEC championships. I think how he talked about competition. You know, competition breeds excellence. I think the stories from a player who was trained by Welby. Well, you think with John Isner, I mean, been. Best American, right up there for a long time now. I remember being up there and and asking questions. And so you think about it. Uh, so he shows up. He's eighteen. I'm gonna guess he's eighteen when he's a freshman. And so now, I mean, eighteen years later, so his life has doubled, and he's got to be thirty six, thirty seven, as he said. And those guys are big buddies, and they communicate all the time. And um, but just think the chapters that someone goes through. Um, you know, I remember where, uh, and he was telling me that, you know, John just had to, he said, go fishing for a while and you got to come back and then you got to just get in the weight room mm. because he really, really had to strengthen himself when he came in being, had to grow the expression grow into his body. Right. But I think that's one thing of many you could name out a hundred, but the relationship that he has with his players, but the relationship he has with John is obviously very special, mm. but everyone, thanks for listening. 66. Thank you, guys. We'll talk to you next week. Adios, amigos. Adios.